This video was sponsored by Wix, a platform that makes it possible for anyone to build their own unique website for free. To start this video, you and I are going to play a game. Well, we'll try our best. Now, playing this game is fairly simple. We each have a card labeled green on one side and red on the other. Then at the same time, you and I are going to hold up both of our cards and we can show whichever side we want. Then based on the color combination that shows up and how we decide to play our cards, we are each going to get some amount of money. Now here's the breakdown of those payouts. If we happen to be showing the same color regardless of what it is, then you will be awarded $5 and I will get nothing. If I show green and you show red, then I get $5 and you get nothing. But if instead I show red and you show green, then I get $3 and you get two. The goal is to end up with the most amount of money possible and we're gonna play several rounds. Now notice that overall this game is definitely in your favor. The numbers are almost symmetric, but there's that one instance where I should get $5 to make things even, but instead I get three while you still get two. Now my question to you is what would your strategy be to win this game over several rounds? Because by chance you should be able to, but how would you essentially guarantee it? Well, let's first look at how you should be seeing this game. Based on your payoffs, it's definitely best for you to show green, because then when I play green, you'll win five, and when I play red, you'll still win two, whereas I will get either zero or three respectively, so overall you should come out ahead. Whereas when you play red, it's 50-50 odds for each of us to win five dollars. So here's where strategy kicks in. If you start just playing green every time, I'm simply going to play red every time because that's the 3-2 split payoff. Thus, I would win three every round while you win two, and I obviously come out ahead. Now, if you respond to that by saying, fine, you know what, I'll just randomly play green and red each about 50% of the time, because overall I'm favored to win. Then as a response, I will only show green every time, thus half the time I win five and half the time you win five. So a game that you should win instead comes out to 50-50 odds for each of us. Now, of course, if I start playing the same thing every time, you could counter that by switching up your bets, and it becomes this back and forth mind game. But let's not do that, because you can win this guaranteed in the long run by following a specific strategy. And I'll just tell you the strategy is to play green 62.5% of the time and red 37.5% of the time, and it should be random. Now, there is a range of percentages that give you the edge, but what you see here is the most optimal. So now let's see why this works. If I decide to show only green, then the 62.5% of the time you play green, I will win nothing, and the 37.5% of the time you play red, I will win five. We do the math and my expected outcome is $1.875 per round. Since $5 is awarded every round, that means you would win $3.125 on average per round with the strategy. So clearly playing green isn't in my interest and I better try my luck with red. But let's just do the math again. When I only play red, then the 62.5% of the time you play green, I win $3 from that mixed result. Then the other 37.5% of the time when you play red, I win nothing. We do the arithmetic again and get the exact same numbers as before. So there's no color or strategy that's in my favor now. Whether I play green all the time, red all the time, or any mix, the expected payouts are always bigger for you. The real beauty of this strategy is you could tell me exactly what you're doing, and there's nothing I can do to improve my odds. Since that criteria is met, we have found what is called the equilibrium, more specifically the Nash equilibrium. Okay, technically we're only halfway there, because remember everything I said about your strategy, you could say about mine. If I was playing each color half the time, then you could just play only green and gain more of an edge than before. I'm not going to show the math, but for me to play optimally and reduce my losses, I would play green 37.5% of the time and red 62.5% of the time. The same numbers as you, but for different colors. If I'm doing that, we'd see the same payoffs as before, but now there's nothing you can do to win even more, and thus we have found the real Nash Equilibrium. Or even if we reveal our strategies to each other, the other person has no reason to do something else. Decades ago, it was discovered that in fact, every finite game, even chess, has at least one Nash Equilibrium. This equilibrium is typically not easy to find, and I don't think we know what it is for chess actually. But either way, the interesting thing is that equilibrium actually isn't always the best outcome, even though it can still be the smartest move. Imagine a similar game, but this time if we hold up different colors, we get nothing. If we both hold up green, then you get $2 and I get one. If we both hold up red, I get $2 and you get one. We'd play this several times and keep whatever money we win. 
Now this game is kind of weird when we don't allow for cooperation. For example, if you find I'm kind of being selfish and just holding up red every time, then you might as well hold up red every time too. It's better for me because I'm winning two while you win one, but hey, it's better than you holding up green and us winning nothing. You have no reason to do anything else and same goes for me. So we found a Nash equilibrium. But you could say the same thing about us both playing green. If you're showing green every time, then I might as well do the same, which means that's also a Nash equilibrium. But if we really played this game, what would you actually do? It might be tough to answer, but there is an incentive to randomize your play, especially when you're unsure of what the other player will do. The equilibrium for you is to play the color more beneficial to you, or green, two-thirds of the time, and then red one-third of the time. Because now there's nothing I can do to improve my expected outcome. If I only play green, I'll get $1 two-thirds of the time, and if I only play red, I'll get $2 one-third of the time. So no matter what I do, I'm expected to make about 66.6 .6 cents per round. And for me, I should play red two-thirds of the time and green one-third of the time, just the opposite of you. This here is another Nash equilibrium. The weird thing though is that it would actually be better for us to completely randomize our color choices as in make it 50-50. Because that will give us an expected payout of 75 cents per round instead of 66.6 .6 cents. The problem is, if I knew you were picking colors with 50-50 odds, then I would just always play the color more beneficial to me, aka red. Or I'd at least play it more often, because I'll win $2 more often than 1. So 50-50 odds is better for everyone, but it's not stable as it can incentivize the other person to change strategies. So hopefully you can see how this kind of math allows us to look at a game and its payouts in a different kind of way to create an optimal outcome for ourselves or even both parties. And although the math may say one thing, we also have to consider the human element of this and what our opponent will sometimes do. Like here's an example where knowing how well other people understand the game is key to winning it. Let's say everyone watching this video has to pick a number between 0 and 100 inclusive. We will then find the average of everyone's guesses, and whoever picked the number closest to two-thirds of that average wins. So like if you say 34, and these are everyone else's inputs, then you would win, because the average of all of these, including yours, would be 52, and two-thirds of that is just above 34, which you're closest to. So the question is, what would be the Nash equilibrium here? Well, since everyone has to pick a number between 0 and 100, we know two-thirds of the average cannot exceed 66.6, .6, so there's really no point to put anything above that. But if everyone realizes that, then no one's going to put a number above 66.6, .6, which means now two-thirds of the average cannot exceed 44.4. .4. And again, if everyone realizes that, then no one's going to input a larger value. And if we continued this analysis, we'd eventually get down to 0, which is in fact the Nash equilibrium. Everyone should just say zero, and then no one has an incentive to change their answer. But the real question is, how deep are others going to see into this? Well, when this was actually implemented through an internet-based competition, people who picked zero did not win. Instead, for this example, 21.6 was the winning number, which means the average input that was submitted was around 32. It's lower than 50, so there were players who seemed to have the right thinking, but most probably did not, or at least didn't go far enough. However, after people play this game over and over, they do keep lowering their guesses until they all eventually reach zero. So it takes some learning, but equilibrium is eventually reached. And now let's see a two-player game where betraying the other person is actually the key to making the most money. Sort of. For this game, same as before, there are payoffs for the color cards we show. If we show different colors, then the person who is showing green wins $100,000 while the other wins nothing. So why would anyone show red? Because if you both do, you both win $10,000. If you both show green, you both win $1,000. You'll only play this once and you cannot divide up the money afterwards. So what would you guys do in this game? And let's say you can cooperate with the other person, like you guys can talk and figure out a strategy. What you'll likely come up with is both of you should just show red. That way you each get $10,000, no one will go home empty handed, and hey, $10,000 each is better than $1,000 each. However, here's where the betraying part comes in. If you guys agree to show red, then it is now really in your interest to show green and basically screw over the other person, because then you'd win $100,000 and the other would get nothing. And also remember, your opponent would be thinking the exact same thing. 
Okay, someone needs to get Mr. Beast to have strangers play this game with each other, because I'm betting we'd get some pretty good responses and also possibly some fights. But either way, you guys let me know at least what you would do in this situation. Like if I could offer these payouts and I pick two of you at random and you'd never have to see each other again, would you cooperate? Would you betray the other person? Would you expect them to betray you? And so on. Anyway, getting back to the analysis, there's actually something hidden within the math, sort of, that's easy to see, but also kind of weird at the same time. And that's that playing green is in fact always in your best interest, regardless of what the other person does. Like let's say they show green. That means that you showing green wins you $1,000, and you showing red wins you $0, while the other person gets $100,000. So green is definitely the better choice here. If they show red and you show green, you win $100,000, but if you show red, you win $10,000. You're always worse off by showing red, and the same goes for the other person. You guys would both much rather show green, and that in fact is the Nash Equilibrium. The weird part is that both of you showing red is still better for everyone compared to both showing green. The Nash Equilibrium isn't the best payout, but by playing red, there is a real risk of betrayal and thus you don't have a stable system. If you're thinking, wow, this game seems like quite the dilemma, then you're right. This is actually the Prisoner's Dilemma, probably the most famous game in game theory. Except instead of years you'll spend in jail and confessing or not to a crime, I turned it into money and just showing a red and green card. But the analysis is just about the same. Without cooperation, I would always show green, but when you can talk to the other person, it gets interesting. And it turns out they actually did a simulation of this years ago, but it was an iterated version where several teams wrote programs that would essentially play this game over and over, not just once. Because it wasn't a one-time play, solely playing the Nash Equilibrium isn't what won, but rather it was programs that played the tit-for-tat strategy. A program playing this would start by cooperating, just like playing red and hoping to get the $10,000 payout for both people. They would then mimic the previous move of the other player. So if the other player first cooperated, then it would cooperate again. If at any point the other player betrayed and essentially showed green trying to get that $100,000 outcome, then for the next move, the tit for tat strategy would say to betray. And if the other person kept betraying, then so would the other program. And since cooperating is more beneficial than both playing the equilibrium, the strategy proved to be very strong. Not only has it been seen in computer code, but it was also seen in World War I, where any death by an enemy sniper would be retaliated, but periods of no death would be met with no retaliation, and thus there was an implied truce which helped create peace between trenches. See, this is why game theory has become so big. It can help us analyze and understand strategies and optimal outcomes in real life scenarios. Game theory can be used to analyze international conflict and find best strategic plays for both sides. It's used a lot in economics to analyze auctions, business mergers, or the fair division of assets. And it's seen in Pursuit Evasion games where each player wants to use best strategies to either catch the other or avoid being caught. So although game theory may not help you do any better at traditional games, it can really open your eyes to the mathematics of decision making and how to create optimal outcomes for yourself and or others. And before we end this, I just want to thank Wix for sponsoring this video. One thing I've talked about in another video was how during my first job I actually tried building a business on the side, and how during that time I taught myself how to write in HTML, CSS, PHP, and JavaScript so I could build a website. And let me tell you, that took a lot of time that could have easily been saved. With Wix, anyone can build their own website for free, and no programming experience is required. You could start a blog, online store, a personalized portfolio for business purposes, and really anything else you can think of. In fact, without spending any money, let me show you how easy it is to get your website up. Let's say I want to make a blog to go along with this channel that's of course educational and meant for students. I can pick the type of blog I want, and after putting in some additional information, you get to pick from tons of layouts that offer just the right feel for your site. And once you're set up, everything is very customizable so it's very easy to edit titles and pictures that give your site the personal touch that you want. They actually put this as the default, but honestly, I think I'll keep it. Then if I want to maybe make some money on the side by offering some online tutoring, it's literally two clicks away. I can then design a pricing plan that fits my needs and make the page look exactly how I want. A lot of what you'll need is even built into their default settings. Then buying a domain, linking any payment methods, creating customized email addresses, and everything else you could need is all available on Wix. If you're trying to go really professional, you can even upgrade to a premium plan, which is used by professional developers to save time so they can focus on more important business matters. To get started right now, you can click the link in the description and join over 100 million people who have used Wix to create their own amazing website. 
And with that, I'm going to end that video there. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and join the Made Prep Facebook group for updates on everything. Hit that bell if you're not being notified. And I'll see you all in the next video.